Hi, I'm Anita Williamson. A national audience recently had the opportunity to see just what's involved in operating New York City's vital systems, including the power system. On October 3rd, the PBS television series Nova aired a one-hour documentary entitled The Hidden City. The program included a 20-minute segment on Con Edison and what it takes to produce, distribute, and maintain the electrical supply needed to meet the city's demand for power. Con Edison personnel worked with the producers of NOVA in putting together this special, and NOVA has granted permission for us to make this segment available to you and your families. Tonight on NOVA, the city. It works because of many unseen systems we all take for granted. This is New York City. It uses more power and water and produces more sewage and trash than any other city in the country. How well does it work? And what happens when it doesn't? Join Judd Hirsch to explore the anatomy of the hidden city. Funding for NOVA is provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. York City. Seven million people living in the most complex environment ever created by man. Behind the lights is a hidden city. Vast systems that keep it alive. Beneath the streets there are 80,000 miles of electric cable. and enough water mains to reach China. The Empire State Building would be filled by the trash carted away every month. And then there's the sewage. Well, let's just say there's enough to fill Yankee Stadium. 10 times a day. The city depends totally on four vital systems, power, water, sewage, and trash. Without them, it would grind to a halt. Coffee grinder and all. My kitchen wouldn't work without the support of a vast urban infrastructure. Beneath the smooth surfaces, Wires and pipes are everywhere. Here and there, they pierce the walls. At the other end of this wire are 10 electric generating stations, all owned and operated by Consolidated Edison, New York City's electric utility. It takes energy to make energy. The plant at Astoria burns fossil fuels. Inside an immaculate facility, six giant turbine generators turn out electricity 24 hours a day. They're driven by boilers as big as buildings, eight stories high. Pat Donahue knows these boilers inside out. He started tending them 25 years ago. You didn't have instruments in the days. You went by how it sounded and you peeked through a, a portal, you told how your fires looked. That's how you operated the boilers. And it was all done by eye and sound. There was no automation. No control rooms. In today's control room, you look at a television monitor. The plant is operated by remote control.
Sensors continually check all the plant systems, but there are limits to the reach of technology. There's nothing in monitor 100% perfect. I don't think it's ever going to exist, that it can be monitored to that, to that point. Maybe 99, but that's where these people walk around here. The higher you go, the hotter it gets. With temperatures approaching 130, they say you can cure a cold up here. Con Ed burns more oil and gas than anyone else in New York State. And this is what happens to it. Enormous fires heat the 200 miles of water-filled pipes that line the boiler walls. Steam from the pipes is channeled through the blades of a turbine attached to a generator. Inside the generator, magnets revolve within a housing of coiled wires. Electrons inside the wires are pushed along by the magnetic field and produce a current of electricity. The pipes inside the boiler. Even cold and drained of water, they reveal a hellish existence. Inevitably, they spring a leak from the heat and steam pressure and must be replaced. Come on down. Nice it's an unglamorous fact, but the hidden city requires no end of maintenance. Years ago, repairs weren't made until there was a breakdown. A boiler takes days to cool, so even then, there was only time for a quick patch in a hot boiler. Hold it up, man. Hold it up. Today, replacing pipe is a matter of routine. So it's how you treat them, they treat you. So you really don't run into the problems that you did years and years ago with boilers, thank God. The boilers used to burn coal. But coal is dirty, so the city forced to change to oil or gas, which are cleaner, but more expensive. Economy is a prime consideration for any investor-owned utility. So on a typical day, only about half of the city's power will come from oil or gas-burning plants. Even oil and gas have their problems. The combustion of fossil fuel releases carbon dioxide, which could contribute to a warming of the Earth's atmosphere. In the mid-50s, Con Ed announced plans to build a new kind of power plant. It would produce clean energy, so cheap that it wouldn't have to be metered. The plant would be located 36 miles north of Times Square at Indian Point. All we're talking about here is another kind of a firebox in a boiler. The rest of the plant is exactly the same. Turbine, steam generator and the like. Yeah, but it's pretty exciting when you realize that this is the atomic age finally come to us, but uh, in a very pleasant and useful form. Well, that's the thing that makes it romantic, and we're all thrilled about it, too. 25 years later, the romance was over, as the public questioned the safety of the new technology. Do you want a nuclear plant in your community? But by this time, there were already two plants online at Indian Point. And we have all of the things uh, around here that you'd expect. Uh, Inside, you know, all of those a nuclear plant looks much like any other power plant. Except in the areas where there's nuclear fuel. All the fuel used in the plant since the first day of operation is still here. It's stored in a pool. 25 feet of water acts as a shield.
the spent fuel will remain radioactive for centuries. The pool will be filled to capacity by 1994. Nuclear generation supplies New York City with 20% of its power. The cheapest power source of all is water, and hydroelectric can come from as far away as the subarctic. In the vast tundra of northern Quebec, the economies of scale are given full reign. The La Grande Hydroelectric Complex produces enough power to fill all of Con Ed's needs. On some days, for reasons of economy, more than half the city's electricity is imported. But long transmission lines are vulnerable, so New York must maintain generating capacity at home. Imported power reaches New York through a grid that connects the principal utilities east of the Rockies. The city pools its power with the rest of the state, and every five minutes, a computer near Albany monitors production to find the least expensive source. The cheapest is always hydro. Then comes nuclear. Coal, which can be burned outside the city, is a close third. Gas and oil burning plants are usually tapped last. Major lines to the city carry 345,000 volts. Electricity travels with the least loss at high voltages. Transformers at large outdoor substations step it down. Small neighborhood installations reduce it further. At 120 volts, it's just right for a coffee maker. Managing the flow in and around New York City is the job of Consolidated Edison's Energy Control Center, the command post for the production and distribution of nearly 10 million kilowatts of electricity. If there's trouble on New York City's power grid, it'll show up here. The Dunwoody substation, a major transmission hub, has been seriously damaged by fire. Because the grid is interwoven, power can be drawn from other sources. This time, the current continues uninterrupted. The chief systems operator is Dan Staines. And uh, people will assume that maybe something has to go back in. They should talk to me before anybody makes an assumption. And... The atmosphere is low key, but the stakes are high. For Danny, the work requires special preparation. Sort of like a ball player getting ready for the game. And I do live in Jersey, and when I drive in on the Jersey Turnpike, I just have to look out the, my right window in the car, and I can see New York City. I always think of, well, tonight my job is just to make sure those lights stay on all night long. People consider it very analogous to an air traffic controller. OK, M51, we're showing uh, indeterminate on uh, Perzon and no flow on uh, just about every single unit. A lot of routine work, and then there's the few times of stark terror. I wonder if there's a, uh, a telephone line cable failure. The electricity has to be generated on the spot all the time. It's not stored anywhere. It's generated exactly on the spot for the demand that's there. Predicting just what that demand will be each day is something of an art. The process starts early each morning with a weather report. 3 a.m. Okay. No. Weather is very important. If it's going to be a very dark day, demand for electricity will be higher because there would be more lights on, especially in large office buildings. If it's going to be much hotter, then we turn around for every degree, you're going to pick up so many more megawatts of load because, of course, there's going to be more electrical demand. During the summer, facilities are pushed to their maximum. So if anything goes wrong, there isn't much reserve. A 
On one unforgettable night, July 14, 1977, a lot of things went wrong. The chief systems operator at the time was Charles Durkin. I remember very clearly my youngest child looking at the sky, maybe about 8.15 or so, and wanting to know what was wrong with the sky. The lightning was so intense. At 8.37, lightning knocked out two feeder cables in Westchester County, north of the city. The disruption caused Indian Point to trip off to automatically cease operation. 18 minutes later, two more lines were hit by lightning and tripped. In less than 20 minutes, New York had lost 65% of its ability to import power. At 9.06, Charlie Durkin received a call from the Energy Control Center in Manhattan. That's a problem, sir. Yeah, Charlie, just one more. I, I, got, I lost the uh, Y88 and W988, but it must have struck by lightning because 81 went out. I'm overloaded on 80 by uh, 1,430 megawatts. Feeder 80 was the only major line left to bring power down from Canada and northern New York State and it was heavily overloaded. Charlie and the operator on duty worked to increase local production, but the big steam-driven generators were slow to respond. Jet-driven auxiliary turbines couldn't be activated because their operators had gone home for the evening. The decision was made to reduce voltage, to brown out the city. It was an attempt to keep vital outside connections like feeder 80 from overloading and cutting off. Hold it. Hold it. Yeah. I think we lost 80. Charlie? Yeah, 81? 80 just opened up. 81 or 80? They're all out. With vital connections to the north severed, only two major lines connected the city to the rest of the world. The tie to Lilco on Long Island, which was seriously overloaded, and the Linden tie to New Jersey. The Linden tie was now over its emergency rating of 700 megawatts. What's on the Linden tie? <laughs> oh my God. Linden tie is up to 743. 743? Well, wait a minute, 906. 906. Yes. Okay, shed load. Yeah. Shedding load, pulling the plug on neighborhoods, was the last thing Con Ed could do to preserve the incoming lines. But it was too late. Lilco, afraid of going down with the city, disconnected New York. Five minutes later, the tie to New Jersey short-circuited. The local plants reeled from the wildly fluctuating load and one by one tripped off. At 9.36, almost an hour after the first lightning struck, the city fell black. Without TV or air conditioning, whoever could make it out went out. Restaurants and bars stayed open. On Broadway, Liv Ullman played Anna Christie by candlelight and finished to a standing ovation. The darkness seemed to release both the best and the worst in everyone. Hundreds of buildings were set ablaze. At Bellevue, the city's largest hospital, emergency generators failed to come on. Surgery was finished by flashlight. Charlie Durkin made his way to energy control through the darkened streets. Uh, I took the responsibility when I came in uh, to lead the restoration process. The logistics of doing it were immense. I never had realized what we'd have to do to do to get the system back, to get oil systems running, to get circuit breakers prepared to be restored, uh, to get the proper generation in the proper areas. I don't think any of us ever felt that we would have been tested the way we were tested that day. Con Ed employees worked around the clock to reactivate a system that wasn't designed to go off. 25 hours after the city fell black, power was fully restored. The Energy Control Center was redesigned after 1977, along with the procedures for running it. 
Today, when a storm approaches, local electrical production is fired up to replace the power coming in on overhead lines. Jet-driven turbines can be started by remote control. And when power is lost, a computer goes to work, plotting contingency plans. People who work in this business never say never. But if another major blackout occurs, it probably won't be for the same reasons as the last one.